Thank you very much, Stephanie, for this very nice introduction. Thank you, uh, the organizing committee, for inviting me. Um, it's really an honor to having the opportunity to yeah, participating in this autumn school. And of course, um, well, yeah, I'm, ha I'm happy also to welcome the audience. And um, it's always a little bit difficult so coming from so far away, but given the circumstances, I'm very happy that we managed that. Um, yeah, so the today's topic, which I choose, is uh, urban and peri-urban agriculture in the EU. And the background is basically that, meanwhile, four years ago, the European Parliament um, came to us and asked us to provide a study on this topic because, um, yeah, members of the parliament across the parties, across the countries had an interest in this phenomena and wanted to know more about the distinctive features and the potentials. Um, you might now think, well, four, four years ago is not so really fresh, but the point why I picked it is that actually only this year, the German municipalities. So we have a committee of the German cities and they all together also decided, ah, that's an interesting issue. And they came basically up with very, very similar questions. And then also the agricultural ministers from the German federal states jumped on that and said, ah, yeah, the cities are asking for that. We are now also asking for that. And as Pablo told me that today, you already were a little bit complaining that your municipalities are so slow. Maybe it's the, the essence or the particularities of transformative processes that they start slowly, but then they suddenly come into jumping and getting their um, influence at, in other spheres. And um, so I hope that will be the case. And that's why we have today this topic. So uh, the presentation is structured into three parts. First, I want to explain the distinguishing uh, elements and the particularities uh, of this type of agriculture. Then I will go into the motivations and objectives and potentials. And then I will skip a little bit away from this study, where, which is also available um, on the internet, and go into a question which you particularly had, which is estimates on quantitative production outputs. Um, these three topics will be dealt with along seven questions. First, the question is, of course, what do we talk about when talking about urban and peri-urban agriculture and how is it dealt with in theory? And basically, there are different views which mainly um, start from looking into this particular space. And if you look on the very, um, on the left, right, left side, on the, on the top, you see this uh, very, um, let's say, um, reduced, view of having um, a kind of, of, of nested circle system where you say in the very center, we have the city center, that is the core where mainly the consumers are located. Then around that we have the inner urban and the suburban and that is so to say what we usually call the urban area, what you also find in, for example, Carina land covers as continuous and discontinuous urban fabric. So it has to do with the settlement structure. And it is, as you see underneath in this orange um, arrow, the built up area. But if we go beyond that, we come to the urban fringe and we come to the urban periphery. So this is also terms which are used in literature. And this together is, um, we would define as the peri-urban. And this is then also distinguished from what is now here in dark greenish, the rural hinterland. And of course, this is a very, um, let's say, um, yeah, specific or, or artificial view on it. And as you see on the bottom, of course, in the reality, it is a, it is a more continuous development. And of course, it is not always so in, in this ideal type, but we also have often um, larger or smaller groups of settlements with the peri-urbans and then they are some some yeah settlements are together and this is especially because in many parts of Europe but I'm sure also in certain parts of the Ukraine you have a polycentric agglomeration pattern this is just the settlement structure still we can identify this ideotypical view of what is urban what is peri-urban and what is rural on that and basically, we have to say it is a transition zone. It is a transition zone between city and countryside. And it is 
um, not a discrete area, but a diffuse territory. But it has very specific uh, combinations of features and um, phenomena, and those are developed or those have been developed through the specific activities in urban zones. And if we now look into agriculture, how is then this particularity of this, of this urban um, life also and urban settlement uh, affecting agriculture? Um, we see or we know that in, in our discussions for quite a long time, it has been mainly seen as pressures. Um, that there is competition, especially on land, um, because you know, if you want to have land for construction areas, usually the prices are, are increasing because for construction, more higher prices are paid than for, for producing um, agricultural um, products. And also labor markets in the cities are different and have different payment levels than in the rural countryside. And therefore, um, agriculture comes into pressure with other urban functions. But more and more, we also see that there are also opportunities. There is the proximity to consumer markets and also their infrastructure, but there's also yeah, a different type of people sometimes living, or not sometimes often, so it's always mixed, but you have in urban, urban areas often rather a higher share of a creative milieu. So the, you have more, let's say, um, now, well, maybe not open-minded people, but people who try new things, who are experimenting. And um, we know also from sociology that urban communities are often drivers for transformation and for transition. And through this coming together of the pressures and of the opportunities and of being somehow under the, under the condition of having not much space, but also seeing that there are new ideas, um, also very specific adaptation strategies and business models arise and also um, the development of alternative food networks, local food chains and yeah, other, let's say, more diversified networks is a particular thing which developed in urban areas. And if we look into phenomena which we see in uh, urban regions in uh, Europe in the, yeah, especially this alternative scene, there is a lot of um, development which has to do on the one hand with diversifying gardening, opening gardening from the private sector more towards communities, more towards really very open things up to finally birria gardening where you enter into public spaces just growing their vegetables without, naya, basically maybe often even without a contract. Um, you have, on the other hand, city farms, you have educational farms, but you also have, like here in this um, container, um, the prototypes for a new systems. So this is, for example, a prototype for an aquaponic, small aquaponic system, where you combine the production of fish with the production of herbs and um, salads, because the the feces, or so the, the residue, so to say, from, from fish production or what comes from the fish production in terms of nutrients into the water can flow in order to feed the salad and then go back into the system. That is the very simple way. It's a bit more complicated, but that's the basic idea behind it. And um, so we can say within this urban center, we often have um, the production of plants and animals on comparably small spaces within these urban areas. But the particularity is that it is not farmers who do that, but it's often, um, they are actors who have no formal agricultural education and who also often are seldom profit oriented. That's actually the, this type of urban agriculture which developed more and more visibility over the last years. And they also often use um, set aside spaces. It's often also only temporary use if there is a construction site, but the, it's not yet clear when the building starts. It can be negotiated with the, with the um, local municipality that, for example, an initiative can use this for three years only, and then they decide for mobile seedbeds, etc. So it is a very 
sometimes within the business model or within the gardening model, there is this temporary perspective. Um, and through this also new connections of objectives means production plus social meeting point and so on develop. And also new concepts and techniques, for example, with regards to water reuse, reuse or recycling um, um, fertilizers are experimentally used. And uh, it is also acknowledged to deliver innovative um, and positive solutions for sustainability. So this is often already in the concept of such initiatives. Um, we developed a typology some years ago where we differentiate the distribution levels, the interests and the actors. And what we have in many, many countries already traditionally, and I'm sure you will have it also in Ukraine, is that we have the individuals, the private households, um, develop having more or less as a kind of subsistence production on a micro level means for the family only, for the friends, for the direct neighbors. But then if we go to the next level, the meso level, meso level, we also have a lot of associations and startups which have mainly also a so social cultural interest um, in developing gardening, also as an activity which brings people together and makes sharing knowledge and um, having, a, having a meaningful leisure time together. And then we have the third level companies, which are really commercially um, oriented, still work in the urban. This is more what is based on new technological innovations. And they then also distribute their produce on macro. But often we do not see this kind of, pro of um, ideal types. And we have often rather a mix. So as I already mentioned, as an ideal type, which is located in the corners, you have, for example, the subsistence means household garden, balcony garden. Or if you go to the social cultural dimension, you have school gardens, for example, or if you go to the commercial, you go to mushroom indoor farms. This is very, very specific, but you can also have certain subtypes which already bring a second dimension. Allotment gardens or weirea gardens or aquaponic farms. So there is not only the one prevailing interest. Or we have really mixed types where all these three dimensions come together. And this is usually the case in community gardens or intercultural gardens, or also in self-harvesting gardens. I don't know whether you have talked about this over the last years or uh, days or know this type, but that is basically a kind of um, community supported farm in the very urban center where a farmer starts preparing um, the seed beds and also cares for certain services, like for example, irrigation. We, for example, have here a type where the fields are really circular so that you can take this sector irrigation and um, it looks then like a cake. And then consumers just rent in for one piece of the cake with small, uh, so within the inner circle, some crops which don't take much space, like herbs also, and then comes the carrots, and, and where the piece of cake is larger, then you have the maize, and so on. And that the way of already seeding in, it's in is done by a farmer, but the consumers um, are in this kind of self-harvesting type. So it's a very specific type of CSA, um, and very mixed. Um, in contrast, the peri-urban is very different. Um, you see here a picture from Berlin. You see that, and that this has to do with the history of Berlin. So we have this inner uh, densely populated area. And then it was Berlin, of course, with the, um, before the reunification with the two states and the not given possibility to cross the border. So we have then really the starting hinterland. But what you also see here in this picture is that it is not the type of agriculture which actually is going to feed the city because we have in the direct interface to this town uh, horses and we have ornamental plants and we don't have the vegetables and we don't have the wheat. So it is a different type also of things which are growing there which are not directly meeting the urban demand in any case or in every case. So. The peri-urban agriculture 
shows much more this um, tension also in its in its structure in its characteristics between the town the 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 land prices and so on that land is taken out of the farm for infrastructure projects and so on and uh, the the expansion of the urban space has had this influence on the peri-urban and therefore it is often organized also within this um this this um um, yeah, this is, let's say, discontinuous urban fabrics. Um, still, the cultivation of crops and the rearing of animals um, is organized there in within the surrounding of the boundaries of the city. But it is also that we see here that it is particularly um, expressing a ve very heterogeneous um, structure of farm types and systems and activities and practices by directly responding to the um, to the also demands of the of the urban communities, and this is mainly visible in the specialization. So it can be specialization of production of vegetable production can be also in glass houses, but it can be as you see here in the picture also by having very diversified sortiments of salad. So what is, so to say, topping on what is globally or from the global markets or from the international markets available. And uh, we also see that particularly organic farming is very important or has gained a, a larger importance in the peri-urban than in the very rural because of the possibilities of direct marketing. Uh, also community supported agriculture and with this of course all the eco ecological principles gain more importance and of course benefit from the possibility to having the direct interaction between consumers and producers and I know that you yesterday also also talked about this agroecology tools so we really have the spatial conditions which allow us to entering into this level four and five when it really comes up to getting into, or three, getting into level three of the agroecology tool means getting into the landscape, getting into the consumer interaction, getting into the questions of food sovereignty, food governance. This has to do with the space where you are. And this is particularly um, beneficial or, or has positive preconditions if you are in the peri-urban. And here you see this type of distribution hubs, which of course, uh, have it much more difficult in a, in a rural where you have a low population density. But also this diversification of farm income can lead to forms which are um, then not so much production oriented, but more leisure oriented, like horse riding, like whatever um, event farms, like here with the children, uh, birthday parties and so on. Um, yeah. But as already said, especially the uh, community orientation is a, is a very particular and important pillar. And I'm sure you talked about that already over the last days. Looking now into the benefits. So which are the potential benefits and opportunities which come particularly from these types? We have now here, and I cannot go into detail, but I will provide you the slides, organized on the top these different types, which are on the left hand, more this community oriented and alternative food networks. Then in the middle, we go into, so like community supported agriculture. Then in the medium part, we go into um, forms which take place in urban and peri-urban agriculture due to administrative intervention. It can be school gardens, but it can also be something like, um, making agriculture a part of green infrastructure, so continuous productive urban landscapes is such a key word, or land, productive landscape management. So this forms where really an authority just integrates uh, farming into a larger um, strategic greening program. And on the very right hand, you have types which are more technology driven, like intensive vegetable production, aquaponics, hydroponics, agroparks, or zero acreage farming means also um, agriculture on and in buildings. And here we have now on the left hand different economic 
indicators. And uh, they start with, uh, in, with supporting the local economic st stimulation, job creation, job readiness, uh, but then they go also down to income creation, market access, and innovation and competitiveness. And you see just from this picture that the, the frequency and also the diversity of contributing even to the economic sector is quite large by this, let's say, alternative food networks, where we also see a lot of um, implementation of agroecological principles, while um, also, of course, on the on the right hand, so it's it's rather a broad distribution. Also, uh, of course, those uh, forms which are clearly business and let's say technology oriented come from the economic perspective and therefore have a quite high um, yeah, delivery of economic benefits. If we go to the environmental benefits, it's already yeah, much um, less um, dense, the picture, than we had expected this maybe. And what you see is, if we come now here from, for example, environmental conservation and biodiversity, water and soil management, reduction of CO2 emissions, closing nutrient cycles, uh, improving air quality and reducing noise and so on. Um, we see that actually those forms um, perform very well where actually um, the municipalities have taken care for bringing them into a spatial continuity. So not having this isolated things, but bringing them together really improves the diversity also and the fulfillment of these ecological benefits. And going to the societal benefits, we again see that here these alternative forms have really a lot of very diverse benefits. So like socially integrated, integrated agents, community building, social inclusion, interaction, skills and knowledge acquisition, but also food security and place making and identity. And there, of course, the more technological driven, the, um, the solutions are the less dense and diverse is this, uh, let's say, society, social, societal benefit output. And finally, coming to health benefits, which is also very important if you want to justify this as a municipality, why you give support or give space to these types of initiatives. Health is an important issue in order to reducing public costs for hospitals for, due to malnutrition, due to, um, to few um, um, behave movement of people so that they are always sitting in front of their, of their computers also. So, um, there we see also that health benefits across the different types are, are very common and very positive. Um, I come now to the limitations and threats and uh, access to land is definitely a problem, especially if we see that um, mm, there's many um, young people who are well educated, but you, who did not inherited any farm. And, Therefore, uh, they are searching for land where they really can build up their business. And on the other hand, they do not want to really um, directly settle in a very remote area. Often it's also difficult to find a, a housing place for a family in a remote area ra rather than in the city. And so they want to stick with their networks and still try to find work. And therefore it's attractive for them to trying to build up their business in the peri-urban, but then they have to deal with the, with the questions of land, access to land. Um, another limitation is also, yeah, but it's not, <laughs> I'm jumping, uh, really going into, uh, let's say, the more technological things. There are still um, a lot of, uh, let's say, integrated solutions, which are considering all the different, um, let's say, sustainability dimensions with regards to um, energy consumption, carbon, um, footprint reduction and investment costs not really integrated towards each other. Um, another threat or another limitation is that really sometimes, especially in the urban agriculture, there is a lack of agricultural knowledge, that there is a uh, risk of not being in line with the, um, let's say, environmental laws like um, nitrate leaching and so can 
happen. And we see that sometimes really people apply pure compost and so on. This is definitely different in the peri-urban if there are people who are trained in farming, who are trained in agroecology and who apply these principles correctly. Um, also, there is a gray, a large gray zone dealing with um, safety at work, with paying taxes, with quality control, with uh, hygienic issues. Um, yeah. Um, important is that we consider if we ask the question, what are the societal and economic transformations which are driving urban and peri agriculture, that we see that there is a very, very big um, potential to supporting the societal transformations and especially um, addressing this question of aging. And I already mentioned that this, this is an attractive area for young farmers. Um, there we see also that it is farmers who are really innovative, who are really using the social media and making also the, the profession of, of farming really, again, interesting to completely other groups and therefore also bring to acknowledging uh, the profession of farming as something what can be cool and what is not old fashioned and what's not only destroying the environment, but supporting the environment. That's an issue which really young people from the peri-urban often bring into the media. Also women, uh, there are much many more women uh, that the share is much higher uh, of, of this new entrance into farming and the peri-urban um, yeah, agricultural managers um, that there are more women. And also um, there are many examples for working with migrants uh, and for social inclusion. Um, the economic transformations anywhere on the global market. And I mean, we now also see all the results of uh, the war and uh, the energy um, markets globally. But this is also, of course, something which already some years ago, but now increasingly enforces thinking about the weaknesses and the completely complete unresilience of the global uh, supply chains. And this is something where really also um, urban peri urban agriculture show that this proximity uh, and re establishing regional uh, food supply systems from the farm to, farm to the fork has a potential to increasing resilience and to becoming more independent from the large economic transformations. And um, therefore, especially those elements which show us that living a post-productive paradigm, living alternative economic concepts, for example, sharing economy concepts, so, or, or exchanging whatever working force and time against uh, prices uh, is something what has really a potential and what is also coming along with, let's say, new models of work. Uh, and that's also something we learned during Corona that people sometimes also, in, yeah, they, they are looking really for meaningful side activities or they say we, we want to have two jobs, one where we earn money and one where we do something meaningful. And all these transitions uh, are, have also an economic side. Uh, we do not have in Europe um, the question of food deserts like in the US, but there, that of course is something what we might also expect in all these kind of war and post-war um, conditions now hopefully soon post-war, but affected uh, conditions that, of course, also the risk of getting into food deserts can develop. So coming to the question, what are the motivations? Uh, we really see that this novelty of business models and doing something different than farmers did like, whatever, 50 years ago, is really something very attractive for um, diversifying um, and yeah, and for interacting with consumers and also the consumers who are dissatisfied with the global food systems and want just to, to developing again trust with the farmer and to having traceability of the project and to changing their nutritional habits. So to going away from, from the meat uh, to more vegetables also 
can use this proximity to the urban in order to getting into fulfilling these demands. However, food security, and now I come to the third point of the presentation, what role can it play for food security? Um, there is, of course, the potential for food insecure groups to getting better access and more, um, let's say, identity related access to food than they had before, because then they have whatever any cheap food and which is a kind of highly processed and to getting this kind of reconnection back to nature is also something what is important for potentially food insecure groups. Um, this has to then comes along with improving the dietary quality, the diversity and the health. We also found that um, large area demand for urban food supply um, is developing and that, and I come to this in a minute, we have tools to show that it is possible to feed also large cities within Europe from their hinterland. But then we have, of course, to do this on the expand of the production for, or the part of the production for the global market. And we have also examples that, for example, with um, rooftop farming within towns, it would be possible, like we also showed this for Bologna, to producing uh, more than 70% of the vegetable demand locally. Um, however, what is always now discussed being the model of the future is having these indoor farms, having vertical I mean, kind of shelf systems um, with um, yeah, also organic production within closed systems, means with nutrient flow technique within closed systems where you actually, not like this guy here is wearing shoes, but where you have a, a plastic cover above your shoes because no, no small piece of soil should enter in because it could bring in the diseases, it could bring in the, the pests. And if you make an entirely closed system, of course, you don't need pesticides because nothing comes in. But we also know that many consumers um, perceive this a little bit as artificial high tech. And even if it is organic baby leaf or so, they rather really prefer what has grown in soil, what has a connection to the ground and what has mainly also the connection to the um, natural processes and the and everything nature brings along in, in, terming, in terms of, um, yeah, um, of, of um, circular systems and, and um, yeah, adaptive quality within a, a system. And that's uh, still an interesting and ongoing discussion in how far this is uh, important. So what do we know about the production outputs in urban farming? And now I distinguish between urban and peri-urban. There are actually no official figures available because uh, there is some case studies which say that it can be between 18% and 100% of the vegetable, the vegetable demand which can be produced in cities, but that has a lot to do with the type of city and the climate and the productivity and so on. And there are some more um, few examples of rooftop gardening, for example, in Barcelona in an industrial area, they say that what they measured 50% of the tomatoes can be produced there. Or in Boston, they said seven to 10% of the urban space is sufficient, is sufficient in order to cover Boston's demand. Or as I already mentioned, Orsini with the 77%, which feeds then the vegetables of Bologna, but it is difficult to assess. And here is the results of a study uh, of a European project in, on, 40, on 74 sites over two years and they compared individual gardens, so allotment gardens, home gardens, and community gardens, so collective gardens, non-for-profit, and urban farms for profit. And they did it in France, in the US, in the UK, in Germany, and in Poland. And you see here the food harvested in kilo per square meter has somewhat also to do with the, with the let's say, tradition and the affection. If you have a garden, then you have really a garden, and then you really do a lot, or you do it whatever as leisure aside. So there is a strong difference between what the people in France, um, yeah, so how intensively the people in France use their gardens compared to the other countries. 
but it's also interesting to see that really the collective gardens can are on performing on the high on the same level like the uh, for profit urban farms so it is not that only the for profit farms are high in yield but it can also be a community garden and that they are markedly higher than the individual gardens and what's also interesting is that they also saw the in entire system so how does this then deal with water consumption and again the french who produce a lot use a lot of water but uh, also we saw, and this is here on the right hand, very interesting that the urban farms, so also often this like not new technology based systems are not really efficient in the water use. So the system approach has not really implemented and that actually they need much more water for providing the same amount of, of uh, food than for example, the collective or the community guard. So this is also something important for the political discussion, having the food and water nexus, and maybe also the energy nexus in, in their own brain. Another interesting story was a cost benefit analysis um, done by Schön et al. And they uh, calculated what basically the um, yeah, the, the cost uh, side of this entire thing is, and they worked in a crew, they calculated that in a community garden where there is a very specific smaller food growing area and by assessing um, different benefits like the increased self-esteem, the reduced isolation of people and the emotional well-being and how much this is basically, um, yeah, a benefit by reducing other costs, uh, public costs, they found out that actually uh, on three um, pound um, invested, oh no, on three, on one pound invested or spent, three pounds of output came. Means that especially this public value benefits of 250,000 uh, pounds is much higher then, then finally, really the, the sales uh, of, of the produce or of the plants itself. So it is really uh, the, all these societal and they didn't calculate the environmental effects have a very high uh, value. I briefly give this only for you for looking into this on the next days. There are self-assessment tools which are used in um, this type of community farms for collecting data. You can also find that there are, um, so there are really a lot of uh, informations and sheets which you can download. And you also get this kind of information here, like uh, this harvesting fuel my harvest, where you can bring in, that's the size of, of the entire garden, that's the shares of the different vegetables, that's what, I, what I'm going to, um, to pick up off and it's very clear what part of the plants you have to, to wait and so on, that you then can really develop together a kind of database like the Harvestometer did already since 2013, where yeah, they uh, now really uh, can calculate also what the, what the value is, uh, how many meals it was and how, um, yeah, so they say 2.4 million pound of food is produced every year across the network. So these are also important figures for going into the political discussion, going into the support discussion with the official um, municipalities. And yeah, maybe now I think time is running, right? Um, or I yeah. don't... We yeah. have five minutes left and that includes questions. So Okay, so then I will not go into this. So what we do on the peri-urban is rather looking into food shed modelings, but I you can look this up in, in the papers because it's anyhow difficult to explain. So it is more like going into this discussion saying, if we want to feed the city, we need, for example, from conventional farming, that area in order to produce the actual, um, let's say also diversity of food, which is consumed because this has much to do with the site conditions. And if I do it organic, I do need a little bit more, but if I, re if I um, taking food or if I'm going to reduce food waste and also 
uh, collect whatever potatoes which are not have not the perfect shape or carrots which are a little, little bit not so straight, then we can really calculate what what um, area footprint is related to that. And there is a lot of, um, let's say, discussion potential with the local authorities to say, this is how we go into to the sustainability transformation. Um, this is, for example, as we know, everyone has like 2,000, every global inhabitant has like more or less 2,000 square meters of um, area um, for the own for the production of the own food demand, we with this food shed model we can we can calculate how much this is uh, this area demand per inhabitant uh, over a year in conventional farming in organic farming or in organic farming if we reduce the food waste and that we see then on the self sufficiency rate how much still above that could be um, could be um, sold to the to the global markets or to, to elsewhere so beyond a regional uh, food supply yeah now i'm a little bit out of time i'm really sorry so i have prepared now here some questions for you in order to um assessing what you think what the potential of um, urban and peri-urban production um for the ukraine is and if you now or later take your uh, mobile phone and go take this QR code, you will have the question, what is the, uh, so what is urban agriculture and its relevance for the Ukraine? Is it a promising opportunity for innovative business startups in the city? Can it provide a relevant contribution to food security in terms of prices? Uh, does it deliver other benefits? than only food that are, uh, but that is an issue of minor importance now. We really need food and all the other things can come later. Or is it just a leisure activity of private persons? That was the questions. And if you go to this QR code, you can vote for it. And the other thing is going then into the peri-urban. Is it an important supplier still or growing need for um, the cities? Mm. Could it better exploit the business opportunities as it's doing now? Is Do you see that areas for per, peri-urban agriculture are under pressure in Ukraine? And do you think it is relevant for maintaining biodiversity or the diversity of cropping at all? So if you now or later or tomorrow go to this, to this QR code, you can vote and we can download this and we can share it with you. Thanks and sorry for, for using too much time. <laughs> no, thank you very much, Annette, for sharing all this information and even the practical calculation tools that was really helpful. And maybe we have time for one or two super quick questions if there are any in the room. There is something in the chat, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There is the question, how does urban agriculture cope with pollution, heavy metals, acids, etc.? So this is, uh, this depends. So this is really an issue in urban agriculture, or oh, there are some, um, some investigations. I know some investigations which showed that it is really the proximity to streets and the question on how large are the streets and how, how dense is the traffic there. If you are in immediate proximity to the street, there can be really an input of, of cadmium, of, of uh, lead, et cetera. But as soon as you, for example, have a hedgerow or something, and this is also something where we should say, uh, especially community gardens often do not really already put so much um, consideration on biodiversity issues. So if you would have like a hedgerow or something and then only start with a, maybe a second hedgerow with food, which are only there in a certain period of time, and then go into the gardens where you have the permanent yield and so on, that can change a lot. And uh, if it is only a small street or so, it is also easy. If it is a public space, uh, actually the public, um, 
the public authority or the, the owner um, who is renting the stuff has, of course, also to make sure that it is not polluted. And if it is polluted, there are possibilities like planting miscantos also, where you have really a plant specific um, capacity to taking the, the heavy metals out. That was that question. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think the next comment was basically a comment saying that the city is constantly producing pollution, just like a comment from the audience. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can try to looking into the Mentimeter whether already something is going on or can, yeah, I don't just close this one. Yeah. No. No, where is it? Uh, uh, I can I can move that one. Uh, no, it's gone. Sorry. Uh, I have to to log in quickly. Otherwise, we can just do it as you suggested that we give people some time and then we download it in the end and share it with people. Now we, I can see, but we can also see whether it works. Actually, I thought I had opened it. No, I, I, I can open this link, so it yeah. uh, works. I yeah, just, but you uh, can open, I think you can only open the link and I can share here. Ah, are you seeing it? Not yet. Maybe it's a different screen that you're sharing currently. No, you find them. For now, we're seeing the QR code still with the voting code. Mm -hmm. now? Yeah, now we see. Yeah, yeah, now, we see. now we see. So, but it's not so many people who are who are voting. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah so but maybe so you take your time and yeah. So we, we just need actually, more time to reflect. Had, yeah, I yeah. And maybe going to the next one. No, so maybe you, yeah. yeah maybe we can give people some more time. Yeah. Right in the end, that would be great. And there was just one last question on the chat asking whether you could give some advice where to find these studies um, that deal with um, green barriers that can protect from pollution. Mm -hmm. um, Great. Yeah, I can put it uh, also, I, I can send it to you, or I can, it's from Ina Säumel, is the author, Säumel, S-A-E-U-M-E-L, um, and I, but I also can provide it, uh, um, yeah, with a list of literature and also uh, the link to the study, so I can provide a small file with, with some related um Works and I also know that especially this work on working with miscantos um, in order to getting the the um, heavy metals out of the soil for urban agriculture has been carried out in Gießen, I think Gießen University. I can also search for that one. So really, this kind of um, strategies for getting the the contaminated soils. Um, yeah, productive again or usable for production again. Thank you. That would yeah. be helpful. So now it's now it's moving. Now we collect some. Um, oh some great! Parts. Yeah, yeah, and then we will also go to the second uh, question, but I don't know how <laughs> because I have here a problem with the different screens, and the, so I don't know now how to get out because the other screen is now black. <laughs> hmm. I will make a screenshot tomorrow morning or later in the day and then share it with you. But I thank you very much for contributing. Thank you. That was really great. And um, actually, there was also an interesting aspect in your talk that links up with the, the following one, namely um, that it remains a bit open how well yeah, new urban agricultural solutions can also be integrated in a more yeah, controlled environment and how open people are to these solutions. So mm -hmm. I'd hand over to Monica. 
to introduce our next presentation. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Steffi. And also thank you uh, from my side to Annette 